From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. A concert supporting peace in Venezuela has taken place in Chile. Singers and songwriters from all across the country and world performed to reject the United States' interventionist actions. Famous Chilean groups like Iyapu and Inti Limani took part in the event, as well as Venezuelan artists, all bearing a message of peace. The concert also saw performances from musicians who share liberation ideals and honor revolutionary trovadors like Victor Jara and Ali Primera. In attending the event, social and political movements showed their solidarity with Venezuela. And appearing at the concert were popular children group Iyapu, a folk and Andean music ensemble. Iyapu were forced to go into exile during the Pinochet regime. They returned to their homeland in 1988 and they have several platinum records. The truth that our people is expressing here even though the media is partialized and do not represent us, we don't feel represented with these medias. We don't feel represented by this government, by the decisions that this government is taking in the name of all the people. We absolutely disagree with the foreign policy of this government that by far is the worst ever taken in this country. We are here to say yes to peace, to say self-determination and we strongly believe that people can change this, this that seems irreversible and I think we are able to turn around all this policy. Our correspondent Tiare Valenzuela was at the concert and has more details. A pleasure to speak to you from Santiago de Chile, where the concert for the right to live in peace is taking place. And behind me you can see a huge crowd that there is here for it. We're just five blocks away from the presidential palace, La Moneda, and the crowd stretches right away back. They are here to say no to interventionism and to tell Donald Trump to take his hands out of Venezuela. That's the message from the Chilean people, a people who from the first moment have demanded the right to live in peace. That's why they've put on this concert. More than 18 bands and groups have come to play here. Earlier we interviewed a song of Ali Primera, who came from Venezuela. All across the crowd there is a clear joy, a clear conviction, and everyone is here to support the right to live in peace. It's a clear message to the President of the United States, Donald Trump, to take his hands out of Venezuela, because we defend the self-determination of the Latin American people. That was Tierra Valenzuela from Santiago. And renowned Pink Floyd singer and bass player Roger Waters sent a message of solidarity to those at the concert. He also condemned billionaire Richard Branson for hosting a Live Aid style event in Colombia in support of the United States' attempts to lead a coup in Venezuela. Hola Santiago, it's the mar March, it's March the 24th. You're all in Santiago in Chile uh, and I'm here in Switzerland and I'm sending you a message of love and solidarity uh, not just to you but obviously to our brothers and sisters in Venezuela because I gather you're doing a great concert there in Santiago today my heart is with you uh, I'm sure it's going to be fantastic uh, I've been a little bit involved with Venezuela when I discovered that that prick Richard Branson was going to put on a, a pop concert in Colombia um, yeah, in support of uh, the coup that the United States was trying to pull off uh, in, in Venezuela, that sovereign um, socialist democracy, uh, I became somewhat agitated, so uh, I, I started a conversation with him. It was very, very short. I'm not good at talking to Branson. I'm so happy that you're doing this concert. To, to see... Um, a, the, a great experiment in Bolivarian socialism taking place in a great country like Venezuela and to watch the evil empire trying to destroy it is sickening. Um, it's failed. The coup failed. Uh, Guaido can go back to being a, a thug on the street or whatever it was that he did. 
And one month after Branson hosted his concert in Colombia, organizers announced the event collected $2.5 million in donations, a figure well below the $100 million that Branson anticipated. According to him, the concert was supposed to usher in the so-called humanitarian aid offered by the U.S. and fund social investment in Venezuela. Ecuadorians took to the polls on Sunday to elect their local authorities, as well as the members of the Citizens' Participation Council. The Electoral Council has announced they will release the official results on Monday. In the capital of the country, with slightly over 40% of the votes accounted for, two mayoral candidates lead the race, Jorge Yunda from the Ecuadorian Union Movement and Luisa Maldonado from the Social Commitment Party. During these elections, nearly 6,000 officials were elected and will take office on May 14. Telesur had the opportunity to speak with Marxist geographer David Harvey during his visit to Ecuador. Let's have a look. The Marxist geographer David Harvey takes a walk through San Roque, one of Quito's biggest open markets. He's here in Ecuador to take part in the forum called Food Sovereignty and the Defense of Quito's Popular Markets. But on the other hand, it's a very human kind of scale place, uh, as opposed to, like I say, industrialized agriculture, which produces uh, frequently a genetically modified product, uh, which, uh, which doesn't taste very good. Uh, and I have to say, uh, for instance, in Ecuador, uh, the fruit juices here are absolutely <laughs> astonishing. I've never been in a place where, where, where the fruit juices are so good, you know, and you kind of go, well, they're not produced industrially, uh, they're, they're, they're produced locally, and, and this is the kind of thing we want. And what much more of it, it's healthier, by the way, than drinking Coca-Cola, uh, or some uh, highly sugared uh, beverage. Urban space like this has been at the heart of De Harvey's decades of work as a distinguished professor of anthropology and geography at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He has played a central role in the development of modern geography as a discipline, but he's also recognized for his work on political economy. In Quito, we asked him about the return of neoliberalism in Latin America. In fact, what you're seeing is a landscape which is representative of uh, uh, a very unequal uh, kind of society, unequal kind of world. And I think in Latin America, the levels of inequality, which were always pretty high, have become much higher. Uh, unfortunately, after a period of trying to change some of that through what was called the pink tide, we now have people like Bolsonaro and uh, Macri and so on coming into power and uh, going back to, well, okay, the rich need to get richer because they're not rich enough and the poor should fend for themselves because the reason they're poor is because they did not invest in their own education, you know, that kind of rhetoric. So, in the way, when neoliberal policies came through in the 1980s, a lot of people felt it was legitimate, and a lot of people felt it was acceptable. Now they don't feel it's legitimate or acceptable, so it's actually imposed by main force. So it does not surprise me that Bolsonaro comes as the one who's going to preserve neoliberalism. It can't be preserved democratically by sort of center left or center right parties anymore. It needs an authoritarian uh, government and actually it's so interesting all around the world we see these authoritarian governments arising, uh, some of them pretty close to being neo-fascist. For Professor Harvey, markets like this remain a space of resistance and a source of hope that even with the threat of force, Latin America's resurgent neoliberals will not have it all their own way. Alejandro Ponce, Telesur, Quito. Sunday marked 43 years since the U.S. backed a military coup in Argentina, during which time about 30,000 people were arrested and disappeared. Large concentrations are taking place in the historic Plaza de Mayo under the slogan Memory and Unity. People are remembering the period of state terrorism and have vowed to never again allow gruesome crimes of the dictatorship, which resulted in tens of thousands of disappearances, as well as the assassination and torture of citizens. And marches were led by the grandmothers and mothers of Plaza de Mayo. 
Another march will consist of left parties and organizations like the Coordinator Against Police and Institutional Repression. This will be outside Congress before marching to the Plaza de Mayo. Argentines will also be protesting the nation's current economic crisis, which has only grown worse under President Mauricio Macri's administration. International aid has continued to pour into Beira, Mozambique, after it was ravaged by Cyclone Idai. The death toll in the South African country stands at 400, but is expected to rise as search and rescue efforts continue. Thousands remain displaced. And in the three Southeast African countries hit by the storm, the death toll from Idai has risen to more than 750 victims. Rescuers have been digging through the rubble to search for victims, while authorities are working round the clock to restore electricity and basic services to avoid outbreaks of waterborne diseases. Mozambique's government is setting up a cholera treatment center for any possible outbreak of the disease. We'll have cholera for sure. I was explaining in Portuguese that we'll have cholera, we'll have malaria. It's unavoidable in this situation. So the government is opening a, a cholera treatment center already and we have teams on the ground. In the United States, after two years of investigation, the report by special counsel Robert Mueller has found no evidence showing that Donald Trump's campaign colluded with the Russian government. This according to the U.S. Attorney General who received the report on Friday. While questions still remain on whether Trump obstructed justice at, at any point, no further indictments were recommended. The investigation started in 2016 following widespread allegations from Democrats that the Russian government had a hand in Trump's presidential victory. Including the FBI. We have more stories coming up. We'll be back. Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. Get access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South America on our screen and platform in English. A critical place committed to the truth to determine the major events that transform the world today. On Monday, only on Venezuela. Welcome back. A large fire destroyed a favela in Sao Paulo, Brazil, on the eve of a planned forced eviction of those living there. No one was hurt in the fire, which engulfed the entire settlement. Some 200 people, including almost 70 children, had been living in the cement favela since 2013, which was named after an abandoned cement factory nearby. Experts in Brazil still don't know the extent of pollution in rivers affected after a dam belonging to the Vale Mining Company bursts, killing over 300. Water is still reddish-brown in many rivers in the state of Minas Gerais. This is despite the analysis conducted by the government and the mining company, which showed level, low levels of toxicity. Environmental groups say that their water quality analysis shows high levels of toxic waste in key waterways. The tellings of the dam, even though some have been retained further down, are still slowly passing through down to here in Felixande, more than 200 kilometers away from where the dam broke and is impacting the ecosystem directly. Almost 26 million people in Mexico identify themselves as indigenous. However, official data shows that they remain one of the most vulnerable and discriminated people in the country. It took some time for Delfino Carillo, a member of the Huichol indigenous community, to adapt to his new life in Mexico City. 
He makes a living from selling artisanal handicrafts, but he misses his old life in the countryside. I like living in the countryside. I have my roots there, my family, my brothers and other relatives. I preferred living there, but because of work, I had to move to the city. His artistic talent and the cultural heritage he received from his parents and grandparents have served him little in the capital. I dressed in the traditional clothes of the Hucho people, but city people looked down on me, made fun of me, and told me I cannot dress like this here. To be honest, this made me feel bad. This harsh reality is common. According to the National Institute of Statistics, at least 40% of indigenous people say they've been discriminated against because of their skin color, or how they speak, clothing, and even their religious beliefs. This shows that all these laws regarding multiculturalism don't show the everyday reality of indigenous people. Laws and treaties talk about the issue. They exist on paper to show that there is development and progress, but the reality is that they are not enforced. They don't respect diversity. Official data also shows that about 10% of the population identifies as indigenous. About 7.2 million of them speak an indigenous language. It's a sector of society that has historically been forgotten by the government. However, the government of Andrés Manuel López Obrador says it's committed to changing this. Nobody is concerned about the serious damage neoliberal policies have had on our people. The destruction of our lands, territories and natural resources, the growing violence and the breakdown of our society. Numbers also reveal that 7 out of 10 indigenous people in Mexico continue to live in poverty, mostly in remote areas where there is little access to public health, education and housing services. Gunmen have killed at least 134 people in central Mali. Fulani herders were targeted in the deadliest attack in recent times in the region, fueled by ethnic and religious violence. Security sources say among the victims are pregnant women, children and elderly people. The assault on two villages took place as a UN Security Council mission visits the country. Voters in the Indian Ocean Island nation of Comoros have gone to the polls to choose a new president. Opinion polls indicate a landslide victory for incumbent President Asali Asomani. Over 300,000 people were registered to vote. The nation has suffered more than 20 coups since it gained independence from France in 1975. I take the international community as a witness. I tell them that I have already contacted the election commission yesterday to tell them that my delegates were prevented from entering the polling stations despite the charter of good conduct that we signed on 19th February. I withdraw my signature and will never recognize results from the polling stations in Anjouan because what happened in Anjouan is a farce. A pilot in Botswana has died after intentionally crashing his aircraft into a clubhouse. He had allegedly been involved in an altercation at the venue. Witnesses said the pilot, who was attending a baby shower, was chased away from the venue after he assaulted his wife. Authorities said there were no injuries or deaths besides the pilots as the building was evacuated just before the aircraft hit. A Kenyan teacher from a remote village has won the $1 million Global Teacher Prize. Peter Tabici teaches science in a community where almost a third of children are orphans and, they have a f and famine is common. He is credited with helping many stay in school, go on to college and qualify for international competitions in science. Tabici said he plans to use his prize money to feed the poor and improve the school, like building a library and a laboratory. We're taking one last break. Stay with us. The life is full of moments. Moments of fight. Moments of hope. Moments that present. Moments that you can live in. Telezur documentaries. 
Sundays, only on Telesur. Welcome back. Thailand's election commission has announced that 90% of Sunday's general election votes have been counted and the official results will be announced on May 9th. This will reportedly allow time for investigations to clear any irregularities and avoid confusion. The ruling Palang Pracharat party is taking an unexpected lead with a reported 7.5 million votes. Close behind with 7 million votes is the main opposition Feu Thai party which had won every election since 2001. We have to investigate all the complaints reported as soon as possible. Before May 9th, when the election commission will deem if these were free and fair elections, we will then report the official results. We still confirm that we respect the people's intention to vote. Whatever the results from the voting may be, everyone must accept the decision made by the people. The process of vote counting this time might have some issues that we need to look into and rethink how what's going on now came to be. The results might have gotten many of you to think and look into how they came to be. Tens of thousands held a demonstration in the town of Alsasu, Navarre, in Spain, on Sunday demanding freedom for imprisoned youths from the area. The youths were involved in a bar fight with off-duty civil guards. The public prosecutor claimed the brawl was a terrorist incident, which can carry a 62-year sentence. Reports indicate that up to 60,000 people were in attendance at the protest. Demonstrators bore signs saying this is not justice. The case has sparked indignation across the region of Navarre, the neighboring Basque country, and the defendants have drawn particularly sympathy in Catalonia. <laughs> Meanwhile, thousands of people in Barcelona took to the streets to protest against far-right party Vox and its leader Santiago Abascal. The demonstrators rallied under the slogan Stop Vox for a world without racism and fascism. They also held banners which denounced leaders such as Donald Trump, Jair Bolsonaro, Matteo Salvini and Marine Le Pen. The protest comes as the Vox party prepares to hold a rally next week before next month's national elections. We're here to stand up, to stand up to racism, to demonstrate that in our society we defend our diversities which make us stronger and that we should not give any room to racism, xenophobia or to those who don't understand that the only way to keep going is through integration, knowledge and the acknowledgement of diversity as part of our society. The Algerian diaspora living in France has demonstrated to demand a change of government in their country. Hundreds of Algerians gather at the Plaza de la République in Paris to urge President Abdelaziz Bouteflika to resign. Waving their flags, protesters said that a political economic mafia controls Bouteflika's government. <laughs> According to a statistics from the European Union, asylum requests in the EU decreased last year. They are now equal to the number from before the European migration crisis of 2015. But many migrants are still suffering. The EU has declared that the refugee crisis is over. This was stated by Eurostat and it was based on data from the European Border Agency. Frontex states that 150,000 people entered the EU irregularly during 2018, the lowest number in five years. In 2015, more than a million people entered, but thousands of people continue to arrive in Greece or Cyprus. Therefore, the problem for the island is very serious and the European Commission and member states need to contribute towards a better 
uh, distribution of the refugees which are reaching the European Union. The EU declaration means that it won't grant extra funds, but even though Europe says the situation is stabilizing, in 2018 more children died in the war in Syria than in any of the previous seven years. Two of Mariam's children were wounded by a missile. When she was pregnant again, seven months ago, she came to Greece to ask for asylum, even though it wasn't her desired destination. When they had my kids, we decided to escape. We wanted to go to Germany, where our family is. The Alawi family also ran away from Syria after a bombing that killed five of them. One of their children lost his arms. They want to go to any northern European country, but they have also been forced to go to Greece, where the process lasts in between a year and a half and three years. The situation in Greece is much better than in our country. Nothing can be compared to Syria. But we'd rather live in Germany, Norway, Sweden, Belgium or Holland. Mohammed waited a year and three months to get his asylum request approved in Greece, but now he's been waiting several months for an appointment to get his fingerprints taken, which he has to do before he can receive his ID. When I was in Iraq, I thought that Europe would mean a better future for me, a better life. I didn't notice that in Europe I was going to suffer as a refugee, without proper care, home or food. This isn't a better life. Sometimes I even think I would be better in Iraq. The EU transformed a humanitarian crisis into a reception and management crisis because it prioritized the border security before human rights and people's right to asylum. And hundreds of thousands of families are suffering the consequences. And with that we come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories on our website at telestoryenglish.net. For our viewers in Africa, we are on Starsat Channel 461 in South Africa and 539 in Nigeria. And you can join us on social media. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.